Good evening. Welcome to This is Botswana, a brand new show that offers informative, topical and exciting news from around here in Botswana, the land of the blue, white and black. We are looking at the 2023-2024 national budget, which was delivered today by the Honorable Minister of Finance, Mayor Peggy Sarami. I am your host, Gesero Oki. Um, in my debut show today, I'm excited to be having a panel of extremely passionate and indeed patriotic uh, people from across the various uh, sectors of the economy who will be helping us today as we unpack the budget. I would like to start off with you, Rory, if you can kindly just introduce yourself and I'd like to then move over to the rest of my guests for today. All right. Thank you very much, Kisero. Uh, my name is Rolsa Mohoje. I am a journalist by profession, currently employed as the head of news at Gabs FM. And I am here because I am patriotic and I'm a youth and I'm a creative as well. So I'm, I look forward to this conversation. Fantastic. Over to you, Doc. Can you kindly just um, introduce yourself? My name is Dr. Musimani Cecil Ramika. I'm a finance and economic analyst just based in Mobonye village, my home village. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I'm going to move right across the end of the table and ask Rek Aboyaone to introduce himself before we cross over to our colleagues from the Minister of Finance. My name is Kaboyaone Musimanehape. Uh, employment cre cre creativist, uh, basically I'm um, the, the CEO of Jobs by Davis. It will be good luck for me to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, not, I'm going to cross over to you, Mr. Sayed. Uh, good evening and thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, my name is Dr. Said Timuno from the Ministry of Finance. I'm the director of the research department, but please just call me Said. Perfect. Keith? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Keith Jeffers, also from the Minister of Finance, where I'm the senior advisor. Thanks. Thank you very much. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to have all of you here today. Um, I'm just going to get into the topic of today. Uh, obviously, we saw um, earlier this afternoon when the Minister of Finance, as I said earlier on, Mayor Peggy Sarami, um, shared with us what the national um, purse, the national coffers actually has for us. And I think one of the, the, the most interesting things that I immediately picked, um, indeed from the delivery today, um, Keith, if I may cross over to you, is that... More often, I think last year, when the minister delivered her, her budget, one of the things that she said right at the beginning was mention of the fact that the budget, um, they arrived, or you arrived at the budget, mainly through um, a budget pizzas. I think it would be interesting to know how this year's budget was actually arrived at. What was the methodology that, that was used? Okay, thanks. Well, it's... You know, the, the the process of getting to where we are, on the, you know, the budget's always on the first Monday in February. And the process of getting to the first Monday in February is a very long one, which starts, uh, we're going to get a little break, and then we'll be starting next year's budget quite soon. So around uh, May, uh, the process kicks off mm -hmm. uh, with some broad outlines um, of what the budget's going to look like. And... Any budget, you know, at the level of the numbers, there's really three key numbers, uh, and, and everything is driven by those three key numbers. So one is what revenue government is going to earn from taxes and other sources of revenue, and that's really a macroeconomic number, mm. driven depending on what's happening in the rest of the world, what's happening in the diamond industry, what's happening in the region with SACU, the customs union, what's happening domestically with the economy. So. And that's one of the first things we start with. How much revenue do we think government's going to generate then? Um, the other big number is spending. And so around May, the ministries are asked, uh, you know, they, they, this goes through several rounds, but the ministries are then invited to make submissions as to what they would like to spend. Because, of course, most of the money in the budget the spending is done by ministries, not by the Ministry of Finance. So, the, so, so the drivers, on the spending side, it's it's really bottom up. Um, and then the third big number, which is critical, is the budget balance, which is the difference between revenue and spending, and that's either a surplus or a deficit or or a balanced budget. And so, um, the those things are to uh, uh, to some extent independent in that. As I say, revenue is driven by economic factors, 
Um, spending is driven by what ministries want to do and national priorities. Um, and the budget balance, particularly if there's a deficit, you know, it's you, you can't have huge deficits because that means you end up doing lots of borrowing, etc. So there's there's parameters uh, which we in the ministry call the fiscal envelope. Mm -hmm. And um, so that process of setting those big numbers starts uh, around May and then it goes through med many rounds and, and one of the, uh, the first things we do in the Ministry of Finance is what's called the budget strategy paper which sets out a lot of the technical detail that goes in towards making up the budget. Um, as I say, the ministers make their submissions. Then we, when we get to the budget pizzo, uh, or pizzos, which are um, normally around September after the budget strategy paper has been uh, put together, uh, that's when it goes out to public, stakeholders, MPs, local authorities, etc., etc. And then we get submissions from those stakeholders. Um, and then that's when we start putting the budget together after that mm -hmm. process. Yeah. And then, so, so one more important thing is that the, the ministries then get called into the Ministry of Finance to defend their development projects mm -hmm. because typically they want to spend you know, maybe twice as much as than, than is actually available and they have to come and defend their development projects they're spending individually and uh, in front of the, the the Ministry of Finance Estimates Committee. So that's, that's really how the process works from May through till February. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Keith, for, for enlightening us on that. I think, however, there has been... How, how, how do you take into consideration commentary that comes in from the public in terms of their wish to be a bit more closer to the budget. One thing I know is that indeed even um, analysis that comes in is that oftentimes there are sentiments that perhaps the budget speech is a bit too technical. So I suppose the question is, how do you as government ensure that um, the budget speech communicates to the man or the woman um, on the ground? Yeah, that's a good question. We're always juggling audiences because Look, the budget speech, in a way, it's a legal document. Mm -hmm. So it has to have a certain amount of technicality in it. Mm. Um, because, of course, the budget speech is presenting to... It's the overview of what is being presented to Parliament, which are some documents. One is called the Appropriation Act, and that's actually the legal authority to spend money. Mm. and Along now, the Appropriation Act is, itself is quite short. It's a couple of pages, just a list of numbers by ministry. Um, but behind the Appropriation Act, there are some very detailed documents called the the uh, financial statements and tables and estimates of revenue and expenditure. And you know, and these these are documents that are this thick, mm. and they have to be approved by Parliament mm. for ministries to get their money on the first of April. So. There are some legal requirements, mm. and the budget speech has to has to summarise all of this. So, Absolutely. to try and make it a bit more palatable to to the to the man or woman in the street, we have the budget speech. Then we have a number of other documents, and one is called the budget in brief, mm -hmm. um, which uh, goes along with the budget and is a bit more graphical and high level. Though it does also have some tables in it. Mm. Then we have the people's guide to the budget which is a simplified version, and that is in English, and it is in Setswana, and it, it is in Braille. Mm. So that's really where the, we try and do something that's less okay. technical. But the budget speech itself, mm. because it's not just talking to, as my colleagues like to say, the average Matswana, mm. um, it's also talking to the international community, it's talking to investors, it's mm. talking to the IMF, it's yeah. talking to a whole heap of mm. different stakeholders who have different expectations. All right. Thank you, Keith. Um, I'm going to cross over to you, Rory. Obviously, as a, as a young and buzzing um, <laughs> a creative, I must say, as a representative of the youth, what is it that you would like to see? in terms of gathering information leading up to the finalization of, um, of the budget speech? I think definitely a lot more consultation 
Um, we understand that you know some stakeholders were consulted or are being consulted in the build up, but I don't think a lot of young it's people. Sufficient. Yeah, it's, it's it's not sufficient. A lot of young people, um, even during our research and interviews, um, we found out that not a lot of young people actually know what the budget speech is and how it benefits them. Even the average Motswana Kohai is really not aware of you know, what the budget speech entails and why really they should be bothered with it, mm. right? So I think consultation for sure should be done a lot more in terms of youth representatives. Okay. And I think obviously you and your colleagues um, in the media fraternity obviously play quite a huge role in terms of dissemination, disseminating information uh, pertaining to the budget speech. And I think um, it would be appropriate. I mean, you also have um, um, entities such as MISA. I think there's always great opportunity to collaborate in this case with government and come up with solutions such as the ones that you're putting on the floor to say government um, together we can collaborate and ensure that we efficiently and effectively uh, communicate and share information on the budget speech uh, to the ordinary Motswana. And, um, and I am aware that um, obviously just touching a little bit uh, more in terms of just the numbers from today, one of the highlights that I personally noticed is that there's very, uh, uh, they're very similar in terms of just the hierarchical allocation of funds uh, per ministry. Last year, I think we, ha we had the Minister of Education coming first. Uh, this year, we still have the Minister of Education coming first. I know the factors and the parameters are different, but at the end of the day, you still have that same hierarchy that kicks off with the Ministry of Education, goes into the Minister of Health, uh, goes into the Minister of Local Government, I think goes into the Minister of uh, Defense, goes into the Minister of um, Finance, and then all the other ministries. I just want to ask um, you, Rory, would you have done it any differently? <laughs> I mean, personally, <laughs> yes, I would have put the Ministry of Youth um, at the top. But I, of course, I do understand that you know, we're faced with a lot of challenges, especially in the education and the health sectors as well. Yeah. But one thing that I've never really understood, and I suppose we need more information on this, is why the Ministry of Defense is always like up there. Yeah. Like, why are we buying more military equipment rather than you know building hospitals or schools or, or whatnot? You mm. know. So for me personally, if if we could deal with the social challenges, mm. the socio-economic challenges mm. within you know the fabric of society. Yeah then that would, that would really help. Yeah. I actually thought that an interesting point you're bringing in there in terms of the Ministry of Defence, because for me, I think obviously it's a huge ministry and we're looking at um, establishments such as the Botswana Police Service, um, the Botswana Defence Force, uh, there was one uh, a prisons and rehabilitation, you know, um, uh, services as well. And I want to believe that a bulk of that, I think uh, um, uh, Keith and, and Syed can, can always pitch in there. But I want to believe that the bigger budget or the bigger chunk of it is primarily going towards, um, you know, like salaries, given that the, all those uh, establishments actually have quite a huge uh, workforce. But I think for me also significant for that ministry is the fact that Safety is always paramount. And I think when you look at the recent um, um, uh, things that have been happening around the country, whether you're talking about haste or you're talking about uh, people being attacked in their, in their homes, um, and I think they, there's quite, crime has gone up. Uh, we get that on a day-to-day -day basis from the Botswana Police reports. And I think, um, is that perhaps one of the reasons why the, the Ministry of uh, Defense is, uh, keeps featuring as, as one of the top uh, takers of the budget um, in that regard? <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting because we, we, we have been inundated from across the country with high numbers of haste. Uh, where banks are getting robbed and people are getting, um, intruders are coming into people's homes. Uh, is this perhaps a time for the ministry to now focus a bit more in ensuring ultimate safety of the people of Botswana? Yeah. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much for, for the question. Look, the, the process to allocate funding mm -hmm. is largely guided by by the priorities we have set for ourselves. Yes. And these priorities are derived from the Transitional National Development Plan. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you look at the, the earlier draft of the budget strategy paper, it had about five priorities. But if you look at the, the budget speech today, it has six priorities. Mm. And the last priority, which is climate change, was we came from the youth when we had consultation. Mm -hmm. We say, hold on, you guys, you are 
you know, you are more technical and ignoring, you know, key factors like climate change, which mm -hmm. really affects uh, all the other economic growth, cli um, infrastructure, human life, you know. So based on those, so we go back to the office, you know, we have another discussion to say, okay, look, these are the suggestions we have got from, from, from the people. Mm -hmm. To what extent can we now in, incorporate some of these suggestions? Yeah. And we'll put climate change in, in, in one of the, the, the priorities and allocate it some 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 funds towards it um is the funds enough i think the, uh, the implementers will, will will give us feedback as and when mm. they engage with the with the with their respective ministries mm. nonetheless on the on the budget education i think look all these priorities that we're talking about you know infrastructure development social you know sustaining livelihoods um, um, climate change, business environment reform, value chain developments. At the heart of it is skills development. You, know, you can have all these priorities, but if you don't have the right skills, I mean, if you're not channeling and developing the right, the right skills, you know, then you will not be achieving anything. I think yeah. that is one of the reasons you see the Ministry of Education mm. uh, getting the largest recurrent budget yeah. you know, um, for, in that respect. And, and then the second one, I think, mm -hmm. they, but in terms of hierarchy, you'll see the Ministry of Defense being the third largest the recurrent, for instance. But this is mostly driven by, by, by recent events, like what you are saying, Rory. Look, um, if when you walk around, even the people on the street, I think I saw a newspaper article say, look, uh, people are losing hope on the police. They say they don't have infrastructure, you know, they don't have cars all the time. Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to to you know to, to be responsive to, to the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. And part of the, the budget, if you look at the budget piece, it goes towards the the, the, the recent developments in Mozambique, you know, to support the, the BDF in Mozambique, you know. Some goes mm -hmm. to rehabilit uh, prisons and rehabilitation, some go to the to the to the police service, but on the development side of things, you see that the the large one is not is not in in, in the military, for instance, mm -hmm. not in defence. Yeah. So basically, the the allocation could be better. We mm -hmm. we are open for for suggestions yeah. all the time. I think we will also strengthen our collaborations mm -hmm. and, and 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 consultations. I mean, if you if you read the one of the criticisms we also got in the last consultation was that it looks like the consultations are mostly happening in, in Khabaroni. Mm. So you might need to go further outside Khabaroni and, and get more consultations. Mm. And do a couple of budget pitches around, you know, to, yeah. to, to different people and say, look guys, we are getting to the next budget cycle. What would you like to see? I mean, yeah. These are some of the suggestions we are we are exploring to see if yeah. if they're feasible to, to what extent. Yeah. We also pilot to some uh, during the Facebook, you know, we, I think one of our Facebook is one of Facebook pages where it's very active. We, we, we received a couple, mm. in fact, we received more, I think, from females yeah. through our Facebook uh, platform. Mm. You know, some of the key things that came was development of internal roads, you know, mm. funding internal roads. That's why you see the Ministry of Transport also allocated to, to address some such yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for that. And I, and I love the fact that you are bringing in the element of um, skills development, because at the end of the day, we know that job creation remains um, a huge problem for us. The stats that we got today indicate that, um, uh, albeit insignificantly, there has been some reduction um, in terms of unemployment um, in Botswana, um, you know, by slightly, I think, just below 2% um, in the reporting period. And I think the question for me, um, uh, team, is how do we strike a balance? There is one element where there is a lot of money that goes towards education, but at the same time, when you look at the, the youth unemployment is one of the, the, the biggest problems that we have in the country. And I think maybe over to you, Dr. Ramika, just to outline in terms of obviously as an economist, uh, how do you see these things? How, how do they um, correlate? And um, th does it necessarily mean that because there's a lot of money that goes into um, education uh, through the ministry, uh, on, the, on the flip side of the coin, the numbers are not going down in terms of unemployment. So how do we strike that balance? <clears throat> it's a very difficult question. Uh, firstly, the budget itself, we, we, we see, is very good in terms of comprehensive analysis of of economic performance in Botswana, in terms of figures, in terms of reporting the inflation figures and so on. Like we know now, the budget, I mean, the inflation towards December is around 12.49, 12 12%, which is the the reporting period now. Mm. Uh, but now, on the flip side of the coin, where now we say it doesn't speak to Botswana, we are saying it this way. Maybe in the budget, they say, they, 
this very critical need for the budget to have it's just the one paragraph speaking to the men in the street or the woman <laughs> all the women <laughs> all the youth in the in the in the in the, in the street mm -hmm. how this, so i mean i mean this but this paragraph should read maybe like this i mean this is the budget out of the bu budget, we are expecting 40,000 jobs, mm. measurable mm. figures. Out of this, we are expecting 25,000 youth to be employed this way. All the measurable, I mean, mm. figures. And this, when, when you speak about employment, when you speak about numbers of people who are going to be employed, when you speak about the number of skills that you are short of that you are going to provide this year in this budget mm. then people are starting to hear you mm. they're going to understand the budget mm. now when you speak about the performance of our debt i mean debt servicing performance um, inflation figures consumer pricing now you are not talking to us as but now to us for you to understand you let us speak about the things that we can understand better. Mm. Let us, the total budget as it is, let's say, let's just estimate the number of jobs you are going to create. If it's 40,000, 50,000, 50, 60,000, then we know this budget is going to create so many jobs. Mm. We know it's going to achieve so and so in the, in the, in the, in the economy. For example, last year, we know very well that the minister was saying he's going to is moving towards reducing the salvation to us in the cancer is reducing obviously to the past state challenge and so on and the recurrent budget and you are saying the sign is by 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 using about three billion this was the last day, by three billion to us maintenance and so on. And so I was a bit puzzled, or puzzled on, the, on, that, on that note. Because now, if you are reducing some version to the council and so on, and other parastatians, in my view, we are also reducing employment. Mm. We are also reducing the number of um, people to be employed in the government. Mm. So remember, these are the figure, these are the key sectors that are driving our economy. Even if we have a tech shop, we depend on those who are working at the government. Uh, we depend on somebody who's working at Parastale to buy your paper, your newspaper, and so on. So if we have not created the conducive environment for people, I mean older people, to move out of government and create employment there, then it's not yet time to reduce salvation rather it's time to increase so that we create more and more more employment i was expecting that maybe this year is going to say now because of this uh, cancers this is how we are going to fund them so that as i reduce my salvation as a government now city councillors is is as pertinent with a business person now is going to get some money from private sector because it has partnered with some of the some of the business prominent businesses or businesses in the in, in the in the in the area mm. all the councils you take Kassan and so on we expect those kind of partnerships mm. from from the private sector so now then I will understand you when you are saying you are reducing the salvation. That means because there is other millions coming from the private sector yeah. to the councils, to the land boards and so on, then it's a good way to reduce the salvation. At the moment when you don't have anything, I don't think it's yet time to... If you look at this budget and you are an unemployed graduate two years two years i mean having graduated i think you will become more hopeless because you are not seeing 
maybe you expect a message that you will say a new improved internship program that you will do this and so on then i'll get 20,000 i will get i mean 10,000 i think it's, it's time now that we do it won't speak about employment and speak about 2001.5 um, Can I just ask you, what is it that you think, um, as an intervention, I believe that when we have these conversations, we also have to, um, you know, demonstrate how our thoughts in terms of how we think things can be done differently. What is your suggestion in that space? How do you think, how can you give hope to the unemployed, um, you know, people in the streets, as, as you highlighted? How, how do we give them hope? How, how could we have, how could the ministry have, or the minister have done it differently to inspire hope and, 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 and demonstrate that um, things can and will get better for you? Well, the key thing in the budget, we should have been say, to say in this budget, like you, I mean, the language you are still the same. You are saying employment creation, employment creation. Last year, we are going to employ youth and so last year. I mean, the tone and the language is still the same. So, in, it doesn't say now, because this is what I said last year. Now, today I'm saying, in the youth, I'm go definitely going to employ 20,000 youth. Mm. I'm going to employ 15,000. Oh, so I haven't achieved, but I'm going to employ X number of youth. Mm. I'm going to employ X number of average uh, so and so bad so mm. Mm. okay all right thank you uh, very much any response to that keith <laughs> not to make it a dialogue but just <laughs> high level um is there anything that you may want to perhaps clarify or give a bit more context in terms of the the reasoning and the rationale for some of the decisions that have been made as outlined in the budget speech today yeah i think i mean firstly so one response is that the minister did give an estimate of the number of jobs that would be created. I think it was 35,000 um, if growth proceeds according to our expectations. So there was a number there. Um, I I just want to clarify though that, and, and I was slightly concerned <laughs> by uh, some of the comments from the doctor here, that government should be saying, I'm going to employ. You know, government can't employ everybody. Government employs a lot of people already. And I think we shouldn't get, we shouldn't be expecting that government's going to be employing everybody who needs a job because that clearly is not realistic or not, not affordable. Um, so I think uh, we just have to put things in perspective. It's about boosting the economy with sufficient growth that the private sector or self-employed or even the informal sector will, will provide employment opportunities. But if the other key thing is that, you know, any budget is the result of trade-offs. And there's, if you, if you look at the demands on the government budget relative to available resources, of course the demands on the budget always far exceed what is available and decisions have to be made. A or B, mm. and uh, you can't do A and B. So I think, you know, we're always willing to be guided, and that's where this the issue of consultations, I think, becomes critical. Mm. Um, but it's not just at the level of the ministry; it's also at the level of the line ministries. Because if we look at, say, a big spending ministry like Ministry of Education, um, you know, the Ministry of Education gets lots of submissions from different. People, whether it's um, you know, obviously the teachers, the the government employed teachers, they want more resources for something. Then, I think none of these, of course, no, not everybody is always going to be satisfied with with the outcomes. But either at the level of the ministries, and of course, we shouldn't detach the budget from the process of putting together the development plans because in the development plans and we have a two-year one at the moment mm. uh, the TNDP the development plans are very heavily influenced by what we call the TWGs the thematic working groups mm -hmm. and there are four of them um, and those thematic working groups 
are not just government entities, private sector, civil society, etc., also represented in those thematic yes, working absolutely. groups. Mm -hmm. So I think what I would say to to everybody is that you know there are opportunities to have your influence make the most of them mm. because you can shift as, as my colleague said after the budget pizza consultations climate mm. change was given a much higher profile because of that was the view from from some key stakeholders so there are as i say not everybody is going to be happy there's always trade-offs you can't do everything but make the most of all the opportunities at different levels to put your views forward and your motivation for resource allocation. Um, it's an imperfect process, but mm. it's about juggling yeah. and, as I say, making those trade-offs and prioritization. Yeah. yeah. Let me, I mean, can, can, I, can I add on mm -hmm. this? Um, look, we, like, like what Keith is saying, we are really open for, for suggestions. Yes. I mean, we we're employed to try to steer this economy the way that we, how we get the comments. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, if you if you discuss the if if what what the doctor say in terms of uh, suggestions to say to, to local authorities, mm. if you look at the fourth largest ministry on the recurring side, for instance, ministry of local government, mm. in half of that budget is proposed for revenue support grants to local authorities. Mm. You know, what I mean? so we might have said something like that, like this is our plan. But when we come and discuss with the people on the ground, they say, hold on, maybe you might need to slow down this plan for now and assist us in this regard. That is why you would see, I think if you go to paragraph 88, I think you'll get that, that discussion there that says, look, half of the, 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 the budget for the Ministry of Local Government is towards revenue support grants. Yeah. So, so, so how, how exactly do we monitor um, and ensure that you know, the, the budget is the allocated to the different ministries how do we track and monitor performance? Because I think like, like uh, the good doctor said earlier on, the reality is that the ordinary Motswana, what they want to hear is the issue of um, roads. The many potholes that we see, not just in Khaburone, but in, even when you go to Shaka, we will always see the videos, even when you travel outside Khaburone, you see that um, we still have some challenges pertaining to um, you know, roadworks. The, the other issues are around, um, you know, we've just recently come out of a situation in terms of um, med med medicines and, you know, street lights. Uh, we have um, issues that shortage of medicines, as I said, people want pl to be allocated plots, um, all these things. So I think, uh, and I hope I'm not really putting you in a corner, but I'm just saying in terms of unpacking the budget as it was presented today and ensuring that it communicates, but over and above communicating, it, it's one thing to take a huge chunk of money and put it in a ministry. Um, and it's another thing to say at the end of the year that we are currently in, how do we ensure that this money has done what it was supposed to do? One of the highlights that came out of last year's budget in terms of the Minister of Health, as we know, was the issue of COVID-19, wherein there was a huge commitment and passion from government to take money um, or a huge budget and take it towards uh, COVID-19 uh, PPEs and uh, vaccinations, etc., etc. We know that there was a COVID-19 uh, fund. Um, through which uh, development partners came on board and put a certain amount of money into that, uh, that fund. So expectation then perhaps is that uh, because that money was not utilized for the COVID-19 uh, mitigation measures, um, looking at the fact that you know, the fund also had quite a huge chunk of money, perhaps was there opportunity to take that money and maybe redirect it to buy uh, beds at hospitals, uh, uh, as a result, would we really be where we are in terms of shortage of medicines? Um, would we really be where we are in terms of shortage of even equipment for use in some of these uh, uh, critical government um, establishments? Every day we, we hear stories where people are saying, I went to the clinic, there's no medicine. I went to the clinic, there are no cars. I went to the, I went to the police, I wasn't assisted, there was no equipment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how are we going to ensure going forward that we nip these issues um, on the bud. Let me comment briefly. Um, I think, I mean, look, clearly 
the the gov the government does have problems of delivery and implementation. But my feeling is that in most cases, mm. these are probably not because of shortage of money. Mm, absolutely. And and that actually. Putting more money, I mean, look, there are areas that need more money. Obviously, we benefit from more money. Mm. And that we try and be sensitive to, to mm. when we get supplementary budget requests. But oftentimes, when you really look into what the problem is, yeah. it's, not a, it's an efficiency problem, it's a management Absolutely. problem, it's a delivery problem. Absolutely. So, you know, every year, the development budget mm. goes unspent. Yeah. And, the, and, so, and, and projects are not on schedule, mm. but it's not because they don't have money. Absolutely. It's, there's all sorts of other things. Mm. So I think we should, and, I, and you know, the drug problem in, in the public health system, I don't know to what extent that's a money problem or mm. a management problem. Maybe a bit of both. But mm. I think in general, to be more efficient, we need to look for where are the real barriers Mm. to getting things done, getting services delivered. If mm. it's a money problem, mm. then we'll address the money problem. Yeah. But if it's not a money problem, yeah. there's no point in, in, mm. in throwing money if, yeah. uh, at something if that's not going to solve it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Keith. Kaboyaone, uh, I hear Keith here saying there is, a great, there is an opportunity for uh, PPPs even perhaps with um, establishments that are owned by youth. I know you run an entity that looks at, um, uh, you know, talking about and promoting vacancies and or uh, job positions that may be available. Um, what would you say to youth, um, you know, to, to your colleagues in the youth fraternity, in the youth space, in terms of uh, clearly here, and I don't think it's just Keith, I think even the minister herself, even last year, acknowledged that there is a problem of efficiencies. How do you think we can, as, as people outside, come on board and offer our services to, to government? Um, do you, what's your observation of the situation at the moment? Do you think there's hope, as, as he said earlier? The first thing I would like to talk of is education. Basically, when you talk of education, uh, we mean where everything starts, hmm. uh, where we build uh, someone who can be able to work. Yes. So basically, uh, the first thing I'll say, uh, the kind of education we're having right now, it might be better, mm -hmm. but as time goes on, it should be changed. Just because uh, things are changing, uh, employment rate is increasing like every year. Mm. Uh, we are looking at graduates, we are looking at upcoming graduates. So when you're talking of up, uh, upcoming graduates, uh, it's a must uh, for the government to look on what we can do, what, what, what the gov government can say. So um, ever since I, uh, I was in this ground, I've realized that uh, every year, there's so many graduates coming. Mm. And only to find out uh, the same graduates are hired as interns. Mm. Uh, they, they are not given like uh, permanent jobs. If at all the government was willing to hire the graduates, mm. uh, it was better like for, for the same graduates to be hired permanent jobs. Uh, you, you will find out that uh, someone who graduated uh, basically in 2016, uh, she or he will, ha will have to wait for a certain period of time, at least a uh, roughly four years to get an internship. When you go to the same offices of government, you find someone at the age, or an elder woman or, or, pe or, or lady uh, <laughs> still working. So I was just thinking as an individual, if the government was willing to hire the same graduates who are fresh, mm. uh, the government should come up with some ways of trying by all means to hire the upcoming graduates to understand what they will work on. No. But then where, where is the, the private sector in all of this? I think Keith Elia raised a, a good point to say um, government, isn't it government's role is really to drive policy, you know, and, and the private sector has a huge responsibility as well to ensure that they contribute to the job creation, um, you know, vision. So where, where is the private sector in this? Uh, I wouldn't say that much about a uh, private sector, but the only thing I've realized, uh, the private sector is the sector that uh, is leading when it comes to uh, job creation. The government is giving a little, mm. and 
it's not enough mm. for for the youth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll cross over to you, Rory. You know, wh- when you say in terms of just comparison between government and the private sector, oftentimes when we reach uh, uh, real economic challenges, the likes of um, recessions, um, I, I know that government is usually the one to delay retrenchments and, you know, all of that. But at the same time, when you look at the, the private sector, Right now, the main issues that we have on the floor is that a number of huge establishments are the ones that are actually retrenching. Um, I don't know if you, if you're just linking that in terms of what, what he said. What's your thought on, on, on that? Job creation, uh, specifically for the youth, uh, somewhat a comparison between the private sector and the public. How, how do you think we can play um, that one? I, I'm not 100%, but I feel like the private sector... It's like they bear the brunt mm. of the economic challenges, mm. so that's why they trench a lot. And because when, once you get into you know public service, it's almost as if you're guaranteed. not going to get fired. You're you're guaranteed. Or even though mm. there might be retrenchments, you might maybe be demoted or redeployed to mm. another office, and mm. you know. But mm. in, when it comes to the private sector, that's just it. You're gone. And mm. uh, once they face the economic challenges. There's nothing that they can do about it, and they let you go. So it, it's really maybe a balancing act of mm. some sorts. Mm. 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 And I think just as did you want to comment, Doc? Mm. No, mm. I, I was just thinking. I have just realized that you see, government is our mother. It has to drive the employment of youth and everybody else. I mean, through even the budget, budget speech. Let me just give you an example. We find in the private sector a lot of companies that have employed in tens and so on. They get a lot of tenders in the government. And director will tell you that, no, we make a lot of money because we just get in tens. We are not paying anybody's salaries and we get our meal and so. Government is our main Mother. driver, <laughs> mother, main driver of the economy. <laughs> FS, our mother, uh. he has to he has to monitor all, all of this mm. so that when he gives you the tender, you know, I mean, we have to employ and make sure that, yeah, I mean, people are employed within your, 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 your organization. And I think Dr. Keith Jeffries was right. I mean, government cannot be the main employer. Mm. So when I was saying government has to employ, it was just a question of semantics, obviously. Government is the overall monitor. It's our mother has to make sure mm. everybody there is monitored. Um, employees are not exploited and so forth. Okay. All right. And I think as we get to wrap up our show, uh, maybe just to go around the table, uh, we can kick off with you, that side, uh, KB. Is there hope? Would you have done this any differently? If so, how? There is hope. Actually, we are hoping that in future some of the things will be changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's all I can say. Okay. Yeah. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that change, that that change um, happens? The most uh, important thing is our leaders. Mm. They have to make sure there's a change. Mm. Yeah. Mr. Dr. Said. There has been concern around uh, targets that government sets for herself. Um, I think that was highlighted earlier on. Are the targets that you set yourselves as government um, smart enough? Is there proper coordination between the ministries in terms of the budget? I know um, uh, there's always that office of GEICO. How do you collaborate with this office in terms of ensuring that there's sufficient and efficient um, monitoring and evaluation of projects that are put before the nation through the budget, uh, through the SONA and other um, messages from government? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, if you, if you, you remember the rationalization of, of government portfolios around the beginning of April, mm. um, they, we used to be called the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development. Mm. And then the development aspect of it um, was re repositioned and restructured into a new organization 
called the National Planning Commission, mm. which really should will be driving all the, the development uh, programs and projects. You know, to try, among others, to address this issue of inefficiency. Mm. There is strong collaboration between the Ministry of Finance, um, the thematic working group structure that uh, Dr. Jeffrey spoke of earlier, and the National Planning Commission, particularly in this area, uh, in this area of development projects. I mean, if you go through the the draft public investment program or the proposed approved public investment program in the TNDP, you you realize that for the two years, um, the proposed development budget is 68 billion. You know, 28 billion for this year, and I think uh, 30 billion. Uh, mm. Or 30 billion for next year. But if you go to the budget speech, for instance, you realize that the development program is about 20, 20 billion. So there's an 8 billion uh, difference. Yes, um, there are some list of projects there. But what is key to note is that just because uh, proposed projects or approved projects are in the TNDP does not necessarily mean they are being financed or they are approved for financing. There are still processes and structures that happen at the Ministry of Finance you know, to subject these projects through different uh, processes, like a three-stage project proposal, um, mm. a pr project appraisal that has been proposed in the budget speech. Mm. So to answer your question about collaboration, yes, uh, there is strong collaboration, but nonetheless, you know, there is room for improvement in anything that we do. Uh, we don't have monopoly of knowledge. Mm. Uh, we work together with our colleagues, uh, mm. both across government. But nonetheless, the implementation issue, I think, at land ministries also needs yeah. to be really looked at. Okay. At the Ministry of Finance, yes, we would like to go and implement, but we can't, you know, mm. uh, uh, doing a scope creep into other other ministries is for us to guide them and say, look, this is mm. what what you requested. This mm. is what the people want. Okay. And this is what we have budgeted for you. So go and implement. Okay. It also provides structures where people can come and come back to you as line ministries or local authorities and say, look, I think you are you are slacking here. You are you are lacking here or you are mm. slow here. Mm. And be responsive to to people's comments and come back to us and say, look, uh, last year you gave us this much, but during our implementation, this is what we have found and let's keep on discussing you know? mm. and let's mm. see how best we could also expand our our, our budget Peter process consultation process what mm. Rory has said earlier yeah. maybe we'll see how how, how we, could, we could strengthen it further maybe have one for the youth only I don't know but these are some of the the, the issues will be okay yeah. all right thank you so much uh, Dr. Syed um, Dr. Jeffries the Ministry of Finance year in year out is one of the top four uh, ministries that get uh, the big chunk of the budget. What does the money go towards with the Minister of Finance? Do, do, do you feel the Minister of Finance is, deserves to be in the top five year in, year out? Or as he said, um, your role is to really disperse um, the budget and ensure that it's optimized and optimally used. What is this chunk of money doing at the Ministry of Finance? Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's quite right, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, when I look at this, so the we stage. have this this publication here, Budget in Brief, mm -hmm. which you can get online from the Ministry of Finance, and it's got a nice figure five shows the budget allocation to each ministry, mm. both recurrent and development. And if I look at the, the top ones, it's education, health, defense, local government, transport and lands and water. We're not in the top five. We, Ministry of Finance yeah, is in not in the top five. And no, so we coordinate and we do policy. The, the reason our budget has actually gone up recently is because we had to take a pot of money from a ministry that was underperforming. Mm. And that was the tertiary education financing. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, there have been problems. Yeah. Um, particularly, I mean, it's a very big budget and, and it's got two components. One is the support for students and the other is all the tuition fees paid to the various institutions. And it became clear that there were problems, mm. particularly in the tuition fees. Yeah. There were things that we didn't like very much. Mm. And so that money has now been moved into the Ministry of Finance so we can exert more control and better oversight, mm. tighten up processes. So actually a big chunk of what we've got is actually this money that was previously with DTEF mm. and is now with Ministry of Finance. And hopefully, hopefully we can sort it out, get it run properly and then give it back to DTEF. But for the time being, 
Um, so probably about a third of our overall budget is that is that tertiary education money. Okay. All right, yeah. uh, accept my apologies. I actually <laughs> thought the Minister of Finance was no. one of the top four. Mm -hmm. um, Rory? Yes, ma'am. You are in the creative space. Do you think that the creative industry is a critical part of the national economy? And are you happy with any mention whatsoever of the creative industry in this year's um, budget reading? The creative industry is definitely an integral part of the economy. I mean, there's so much potential, you know, that could come out of it in terms of economic growth. But I don't think we're taking it seriously enough. Um, I, I, I don't remember anything significant coming out of this year's speech. Uh, in terms of the allocations or in terms of just the mention, really. Um, I know our government is always saying, okay, no, you know, we understand, we acknowledge that this is an integral part of the economy, we'll do whatever it takes to help, but I'm still not seeing anything, I'm still not seeing any impact so far. So I'm not happy with that, but I do believe that, you know, going forward, uh, something will be done. Like, you, you asked if there's hope. There's always hope. Uh, there's always room for improvement. As long as there's political will from our decision makers, then we'll be good to go. Um, you, you asked a question of hope earlier on. I just want to know, Botswana has a vision to elevate um, in terms of her international status, obviously, from an economic uh, perspective. We know where we've come from. Um, we've come from being one of the poorest countries in, in the world um, to being a, a, a middle-income country, to being a, an upper uh, rather a high income country and I think we have aspirations to now be a middle upper income country. Is that possible and what is required to get us to that status? Well, it is very possible for us, I mean, to, to, to grow our economy. Looking at the, 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 the current uh, Minister of uh, Finance intervention, looking at the way we manage our budget, we are a very good country in terms of fiscal management, in terms of the Bank of Botswana doing its uh, monitor uh, inflammation, uh, inflation management role in terms of monetary policy and so on. Uh, the only thing that that concerns me is the, is the Youth unemployment, but otherwise, that was that was I was saying in terms of economic matrix and in terms of compliance with uh, Brit, uh, Britain Britain institutions in terms of our compliance in the international space. There we are doing very well, and the economy. Looking at the figures is. We must have food in terms of food. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Jeffries, any last words? Did you want to, I saw you comparing notes or having a chart. Um, <laughs> at just, the end of the day, just to try and narrow the, the gap, budget belongs. To, 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 to narrow the gap between us, you are right, the Ministry of Finance has the fifth largest recurrent <laughs> budget, but not the fifth largest total budget. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I knew yeah. there was some, yeah. some so you were correct. truth to what I was saying. Yeah. And yeah. it's because of this tertiary education. Yeah, finance. no, it's, it's totally un yeah. understood. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much um, to my panel for joining me on this debut issue um, of This is Botswana. Um, the, a podcast uh, obviously is quite brand new. It's a podcast that we'll be bringing to you um, exciting, informative and topical issues uh, from right here in Botswana, the land of the blue, white and black. Uh, all I can say is Botswana, this is your budget. We only have one country. Let's all go out there and see how best uh, we can be part of this conversation around the budget. Most importantly, opportunities have been identified for those of you who may want to uh, collaborate with government uh, as we collectively try to elevate and escalate our country uh, to be where it aspires to be um, in terms of uh, its economic status uh, globally. Thank you.